I met the people from St. Matthew's in Moravia a number of months ago, and as we were working together, um, they are a church who has faced transition, been through it uh, in the last eight years. I think there is much anxiety as I travel around uh, doing different workshops over the question of the changing church and what is next and how will it look and what can we do. And oh my goodness gracious, and I have found in my own life that when I face new challenges, I sometimes do get anxious, and then I see other people who are doing it, and that gives me ideas of what might be. It's hard to think in the void if you've never seen. So as I encountered them and their vibrant faith and their vibrant ministry as a uh, small, changing congregation, I said, hey, do you ever tell anybody your story? Any chance you've come, tell us. So it is my delight to introduce to you the people of St. Matthew's Episcopal Church in Moravia, and they will introduce themselves and tell you their story. So, to begin with, let's take a look at our church. I will introduce it just a little bit here. That's what we look like. We are a small church, we're in a small town, and in a small community that is not wealthy. All right? In our church, we have an attendance of about 35 to 45. We are not a rich church. Our budget is about 65,000. And we have about uh, average income. Most of our people are retired or semi-retired. So we don't have a pot of money here to work with. This is a great little church. It is a jewel within this area. It was built in around 1920. The builder wanted to have a European context and view, and he therefore imported a numerous wooden carvings from Omaravagal, which is, you all know that. So that was the beginning of this. It is now a national registry building and we would wish that you would come and visit because you will be blessed just to look and see what's there. Now, Cheryl, if you would begin giving us a history as to why we don't have a full-time pastor. It makes me nervous when I read Trouble in the Parish. We lost our pastor. It was trouble, it made us nervous, Many decisions had to be made. We were financially unable to support a new full-time, even a part-time pastor. And we were given an option. Should we stay open or close? I didn't like that option at all. I would never close the doors on this church. My grandchildren are the sixth generation in that church. Closing the doors simply was not an option. But to keep it open, it would require a very major change. And if we had to change, how would we do it? The first stage was to get the vestry, the parish council, and much prayer. There was lots of prayer and very, very much um, seeking discernment on what was needed the general discussions and a model building, um, we had to begin to think what we needed without a priest, a full-time priest, I should say. Um, we had to build a consensus and develop deep fellowship with each other. We were all we had. If um, we weren't closing, what were we going to do? Our sister church had already closed their doors and some of those parishioners came and joined us. Without a full-time pastor, how are we going to get along? And we asked ourselves the following questions. What are the services for which we need a pastor? The pastor could perform the, perform the Eucharist, weddings, and funerals. Yes, they could do all that. Regular congregations, members, they couldn't do that. Preach on Sunday? Maybe, but not every Sunday. How about manage the church office? No, we don't need a preacher to manage the church office. Or a treasurer. Back in the past, 
The preacher did it all, but nowadays, we help. We do our own. We to organize the outreach, the social programs, represent the church and the community, visit the sick. We all do that. Every, every one of us in the congregation can help do that. We do not need the preacher for that. Christian education. They direct us in the way we want to go, but we do our own Christian education. And then we ask the members of the congregation what needed to be done. The congregation themselves made up a list on what we needed to be for the congregation to do that a preacher, even a part-time preacher, would not be there to do. What we wanted for that, that list. And as Paul tells us in Corinthians, there are different kinds of gifts, but they're all given to believers by the same Spirit. Each Christian is called to a ministry and to do the mission of God. Underlying this whole process then, we knew that the Spirit was going to guide us and show us what all needed to be done. We had help from the diocesan office, and the vestry worked very close with the congregation on what the positions were that needed to be done. After many, many weeks of prayer, the first decision made by the congregation was to commit ourselves to the concept of teen ministry. What are the areas within St. Matthew's absolutely necessary to maintain? So by doing this, Look at your church. Look at what areas. Do you have a uh, somebody running a Sunday school? Do you have somebody greeting people, uh, sending cards? Do you have an administrator? Do you have people going out visiting your sick, pastoral care? These are the different things that we were thinking of that we needed people to do. So in order to do that, we, we put together we started out with 11 different people on this team. It came down, when all said and done, it came down to about eight people. We, we took some jobs and put them together, like a preacher, a priest, they came together. Um, and then we, we've added some also, once everything got put together. So, uh, in looking over the list, it was realized that no one parishioner could do all this. It would be team effort. When you're putting your your list together as far as what jobs you want, you, you, you want a priest, you want administrator, and so on, you, you want to give a detailed but very simple detail of what the job is. The job description, per se, would, uh, will help the congregation on picking out who fits that position, who in your congregation is is good with the kids, uh, is uh, from the business administration, you know, outside of church. So, um, the AG ministry, I'm not going to, I'll read a few of, of these, but um, liturgist is design and prepare Sunday bulletins, coordination of Sunday services, funerals, special occasions, and worship services. Uh, Youth minister would be, uh, or youth director, Sunday school program, work with the youth on various projects, organize and confirmation classes. And occasionally you'll have some older children that are going to be baptized. We come up with a baptized uh, program for them. Uh, your music coordinator. And then the most important thing is, is we, we wanted to raise up a member within the church to become our minister. That's still ongoing, but um, whether that person will be our <coughs> minister has kind of changed from the beginning. So. Um, how individual team members were chosen. So put together a list of all of your active members of your church. You're going to have, if you have people that go down south, 
that's going to be that was extremely hard uh, trying to get them to understand what you were trying to do. Uh, the letter, you know, and then those that's where the letter of detailing the positions because you're not sitting there explaining. We, we stood before the congregation and went through it all with them on what each job was. Well, people that aren't there aren't going to understand what you're trying to tell them. So uh, detail your, your paperwork for them so, like they weren't there. Um, the congregation is giving, you want to give them just a couple of weeks to pray and, and put the members that they feel are due to those positions. If you wait too long, they're going to forget about it. They're just not going to do it. But when you go to do this, do yourself first. If you feel that you are called to be a certain, a certain, in a certain position, do that. But do yourself first because you're going to forget about it. <laughs> you will. Um, you fill out the enclosed form. We have very important, have a third party, somebody that's not part of your church, bring, bring all, or all the mailings go into that one person and let them do the, the figuring out who, who goes what and, and into what, what job. You don't want people within the church doing it because then it may become a little political. So, um, once she or he tells up uh, what they did was went around to each person that, uh, that was picked for the positions and told them, and then gave them about a week to decide whether or not they wanted to do that particular job. Um, it's very important to talk to your spouse. There is time that you are going to be spending away from your spouse that you normally would have. The only way this thing works is, as a team, you have to learn to be together. And by doing that, it works a lot nicer than if you hardly ever meet, you don't know each other. You do, but not as a team. As a team, we, we work very well because we spend a lot of time with each other. We know how each other think, and that works very well. And then the canon reports to the vestry and parish and congregation uh, on the results. So she basically brought us right up in front of everybody and said, these are the people that have accepted this job. And uh, projected new ministries that we have coming on, things change. Uh, we're, we're going to put together Team 2. Team 1 has been in it for eight years. Um, but adding on to the first team, we, there's some positions that people are ready to step down and, and go. So the new ones are communication minister is someone that deals with local advertising, web page, developing, you know, stewardship minister probably should have been put on the first one, but it was it was going great. We we had something going on that wasn't just for a little bit of the year. It was going year round, so we didn't mess with it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But we, we thought this time, well, maybe we should put somebody in there. Current adult ministries, we really don't have somebody that does all the different, um, we have Marge who was doing the EFM program, which is great. That's where you get your knowledge, you, you really strive to. But we don't have the one person to put that together, and that's that's a ministry that we are really um, looking forward to putting together on that. So back to you, Cheryl. As it worked, yes, by the grace of God, God willed it, and it happened. We're eight years into this project, and we're doing just fine. This church is so spirit-filled. I've had people say when they walk in the door that they feel the spirit. We all are just part of that. It's not, it's not just one person, it's every one of us. And I think the members of the church feel an ownership of this spirit that helps us. If one of us is down, someone is right there with them, 
helping them through whatever's going on. And our outreach for the community, we're doing so much more. We have a second food pantry now in the town. Not only one, but two. And St. Matthew's has helped that immensely. Not just with work, but with money as well. Mm -hmm. And the support for the church, they felt the same way, the whole congregation. Shutting the doors is not an option. We are not even going to go there. And the vestry works with the team, and the team works with the vestry. There are two different entities, but we work together. The team has control over the service and special occasions, but the vestry is the, um, they pay the bills, they make the rules, they, um, the vestry is the, I guess the governing body. Yes. Has there been problems? <laughs> oh yeah. There's been problems. But they've all been short term. We've solved them. Egos have not been a significant problem, believe it or not. They have, we have gone and talked to the person if there's a, somebody's feathers are ruffled. We'll try to smooth them back out. And after eight years, we're trying again, like Dave said, to bring in the second round of a team. And they understand that. They understand that eight years is a long time. But we've all grown in these eight years. We've all gone and noticed that different things need to be added. Some things need to be changed. Thank you. So, we have a vibrant church. And if you can see the slide up here, it shows the activities that the church is participating in. Some by individual members who have a mission, others corporately. So, uh, if you can't read, we have services for individuals, gas and grocery carts, we help people who are fire loss and homeless, transportation, phone trees, welcome packages. Within the ex church, we have a chicken and biscuit dinners once a month, which is not charged, but by donations. And so there are people who come who cannot pay, and they're covered by others. We host 4-H and Scouts and WIX, and then we have ecumenical men's breakfast. In the community, we support the Fall Festival, the Fillmore Glen Car Show, which is a really great event. If you have an old car or like old cars, you come down on the weekend or Labor Day. Uh, uh, we've been invited to join the Chamber of Commerce. Now, they give us a free membership, but the community wants us to be part of the Chamber. And so you can go there, have an influence, uh, invite them actually to come to your church and have a breakfast or their meetings there. Christian ed education. We have Sunday school for children. We have a Sunday school for adults. There are people in our congregation who have no idea what is in the scriptures. And so we are teaching things like uh, what the Beatitudes were, how to understand the Lord's Prayer. This is an important thing. And they're just really enjoying it. So anyway, think about that. Crucio is a external program of religious revival over the weekend, and it's happening this weekend now. And then Education for Ministry is a program, a four-year program from Suwannee uh, University, which uh, goes Old Testament, New Testament, history of the Christian church, and then sharing of what our Christian brethren are. Outside activities, uh, chapel house, prison ministry. We have a prison in our town, and uh, every couple weeks there is a meeting there for the parishioners who are going to transition out. About Hope Pantry is our food pantry, and then there's a nursing home in town, which once a month there are services. And internationally, we are hooked up with the Episcopal Church for a mission to El Salvador, 
in Episcopal Relief and Development, we raised the children pennies for, actually it was to buy a goat, I think. But they raised $750 to buy a goat, I think. And then the, we have a compassion child in uh, Brazil, and then we visit the El Salvador mission, uh, which the diocese has down in El Salvador. Now there must be a couple of pastors here who are nervous. Uh, they won't need me anymore. Uh, what am I going to do, etc. We have in our church what we call supply priests. These supply priests come on different weeks and uh, they are paid a small stipend. So we have three pastors each with a different personality, each with a different emphasis, and it works really, really well. Pastor Perry is where she attends the team meetings and provides the guidance of the service. The vestry, as Dave said, manages the church. The team manages what goes on to the church. And she is the spiritual director of the team. So. And one of the things that really impresses me about the way this works is that these folks are very serious about continual training for their ministries. They show up all over the place. I go to a training program in the diocese and there's always a couple of these people who are there. They are constantly in the process of training, renewing their ministry, improving it, and learning new things. That's a big part of the dynamic. I'd like to highlight a few pieces also. Um, as I encountered them, there are a few things that went by very quickly in the presentation. One was when they came to the place of needing to recruit lay people to lead. Did you catch the fact that what they did was they made a list of everybody who is active in the ministry, and they invited everybody in the congregation to ponder those needs and identify who they thought could fill those positions. We often have a nominating committee or we, we think very narrowly and they involve everybody in the decision making. And I thought that, that for me was a new idea. The idea of them presenting it to the people as a call, as a lay person that, that really the congregation has identified and called you and the time for prayer and the different steps I hope you heard that piece of what was going on uh, as they did this. And then I thought, I invited them because I thought several things. One is I, I hear anxiety over, uh, what if we don't have a full-time pastor? But I also, as a pastor of 30, 33 years, thought, what if in the congregations I served, the lay people had had this kind of commitment to owning and doing the ministry? What else would have been possible with the pastor's gifts and skills? And so I, I think it's a presentation that whether we are growing or whether we are small um, has a lot to think about in terms of how do we shift. If we are finding that our congregations as a whole are not owning what I call owning the ministry, how do we make that shift? so that we release the power that's in the congregation and call it out to work. And what would be the implications? So I, I hope you're not just hearing this for small congregations. I hope you're hearing this as something for a lot of us to think about, about how we go about empowering people. God has been in this process from the very beginning. And uh, the Holy Spirit has um, just been so present. 